Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jinan Kandwanaho and I'm the managing director at Jonaki Holdings Limited. And at Jonaki Holdings Limited, we offer loans efficiently, very fast, and integral services. So we offer loans with integrity. And we look forward to serving you. Where they bounce you, where the banks say no, here. We could say yes, why not? So you gotta give it a shot and come and try us out. So it's a pleasure to have you today. So today we have a topic and I'm going to concentrate on my area of expertise or my area of interest, which is money lending. So meaning that there are several businesses that are affected by COVID-19 and there are many businesses that are coming up as of now that are trying to thrive from the aftermath of COVID-19 and I understand they have their uniqueness and their unique peculiar challenges that might be particular to them. And for today, my point of discussion is I'm going to concentrate majorly on the challenges that are most likely to be faced in money lending in this aftermath of COVID-19. You might uh, realize that some of the things I'm going to touch on are going to tackle other areas as well or other business aspects as well, but majorly I'm going to focus on money lending. So that informs our today's topic, money lending amidst COVID-19 in its aftermath. So a key thing to start with is that you've ever lent out money. Whether you took it as a business or you took it as, as was, as a friendship, help here and there, you've ever lent out money in one or the other. The only difference that it has on your end from Junaki Holdings is that you perhaps lent it out interest-free. And us, we lent it out at an interest rate. Though small, but there's an interest rate that someone has to actually pay. So that's a key significant difference. The similarity is that whereas you lent it out peacefully, there's a likelihood that the money that you lent out, I'm not certain whether you recovered it. <laughs> I don't think that person that you lent to paid back. So you didn't have the certainty that the person that you lent money to would actually pay back. And that's why it's said that at an individual level, if you're lending out money, give out the amount of money that you know that you can afford to lose. Especially if you're not a licensed registered entity to lend money. You've got to lend out money that you know that you can afford to lose. In some instances, a few chat I've had with colleagues that if someone comes to you for money, let's say 10 million Ugandan shillings, and you are for sure that this person is either your relative or your friend, and there's a likelihood that that person might not actually pay, which you cannot prove until they fail to pay, is that you have to look out for a sum of money that you can afford to lose. The sum of money that you can give out free. Like, you know what? I know you want 10 million, but I don't have that as much. I don't have that much right now. So kindly, I'll contribute 100,000 just for just because I cannot help as of now. That's if you know that you are not licensed to lend out money. That's if you know that you're not formalized to lend out money. So you save yourself a challenge of losing a friendship, but also you save yourself the fracas of back and forth with that person, clashing with that person. Meaning that if you lent out that money, you could either lose it or end up clashing with that person. So my point is, if you're not formalized, even if you're lending out at an interest rate, if you're not formalized, kindly help yourself, save yourself, do not lend out. And if you've been operating illegally, because if you're not formalized, if you're not licensed, that means you've been operating illegally. So now is the time to formalize things. Now is the time to register your company, your business. So to run an entity 
peacefully. I know that even if someone loses or someone fails to pay, you can actually recover the money through formal means. That's point number one. Point number two is that if you are formalized, there are key things that you have to look at. At Janaki Holdings, we have the processes that you go through before you get a loan. And in this uh, month, in the subsequent four times of a month, I am going to be taking you through the four steps that you have to go through to get the loan. And you have to observe them critically well if you want to have surety, or if you want to have certainty that the money that you've lent out will be recovered. The first step is loan application process. Or the step number one is loan application. Step number two is loan assessment. Step number three is loan approval. Step number four is loan collection. And step number five is the after sales services. So in our today's discussion, I'm going to take you through the intention of step number one and the details therein. Step number one, which is the loan application. So the key thing for this number one step is to collect as much information as you can from the client. You have to collect as much information from this person because, for example, a person might come in, just walk in, he wants a loan. You've not met them before, you've not seen them before, but you actually have to serve them. Just like someone can actually walk to the bank. So you do not stop someone from applying for money or accessing a loan just because you do not know them. As a matter of fact, before you knew that person, there's the first time you came to know them. That even if you came, that the time you came to apply for a loan in your bank, there's that very first time that they came to know you. So meaning that they previously didn't know you. So they need to collect as much information as possible concerning you. So that in case of any failure to pay, they know where to start from. And it's not any different in this money that we lend. So the loan application step is to collect as much information as you can. First of all is the, are the names and the identity of the person. The national ID or the ID of the person. If the person comes to apply for a loan, they have to provide the information concerning them. The ID, where do they work? Now, based on experience, there are some who can actually forge or go and print their IDs, workplace IDs. It says, I'm, I work with URA or I work with some given institution. And they can easily print this, this ID from NASA. It is even easy. At 15,000 or 10,000, you can actually have such an ID. Now, meaning that if your sieve is not good enough, if your filter is not good enough, that will be a tick for that client because they have the ID. They can identify themselves. So you need to double check that whereas this person has the work ID, what can I double check with to confirm the identity that this person is fronting? Then you ask for the national ID. Now you also know that these national IDs are not insulated from forgery. So someone can actually forge the national ID as well. So you need to double check the national ID as well. How do you check the national ID? One of the platforms that you can use is the Electoral Commission Verification website. Where you punch in the national ID of that person to verify their names and their polling stations. <laughs> Quite interesting. So you have to confirm their names. Just punch in the national ID number. It will show you the names of the person as well as their polling stations. So if, you, if the national ID they have is fake, that information might not come through. Because all you need is not to punch in the names, but rather the national, the NIN number that is captured on the national ID. So there is a good filter. 
if I have faked the ID then, you can ably tell that, you know what, this person is not legit, or this person forged the ID. Now, if that is not possible on your end, you might have to double check with NERA. National Identification Registration Agency. I think that is it in full. NERA. So you need to double check with NERA. And in doing this, know that for money lending, the person who comes to you because the bank has told them that they would take three months or two months or one month to access the loan. And yet this person has a consignment at the border post. This person has school fees that he has to pay in one or two days time. This person comes to us when he urgently needs money. So you need to, as a money lender, you need to provide an alternative to make the client access money super quick then the bank can do that. So meaning that every step that you take to process the loan should be very fast compared to any other entity. So meaning that every step that you use to verify or to double check the information the client shares has to be done super quick. That has to be ensured. You have to ensure that. So whereas you're verifying the ID, you have to do it super fast not to counter the time that the client takes at your premises so the client can access the loan super fast. So if you go through that step of the work ID, then you double check with the national ID. I understand some of the clients might actually tell you, you know what, I have not got my ID, my national ID. And if they do not have the national ID and they don't have the work ID, Unfortunately, you have to let them go. I know you in business, you need money, but also I understand that you don't have money to just throw at people. You don't have money to waste. You don't have money to risk. As a matter of fact, you could have got a loan somewhere and you're using this money, perhaps lending it out at a higher rate than what you got it at. So you're not even risking your own money, but rather, a circle money or a club money or a loan from the bank so you need to be critical so you have to let that client go because they have failed the first test which is the national id or the workplace id so if that those two things are ticked and you know that is done out of the way then you ask where the client stays or where they work from address address for both the workplace and the address for where they stay now if i am telling you this and you can't take it as i tell you you you'll have to learn it the hard way that until you give money to a client and you do not know where they work from the address and you do even do not know where they stay their home address that's when you come to confirm that you know what, what Jonathan was telling me is true in its truest sense. If I come and tell you that I stay in Tinder, Tinder is very, very big. Tinder is very, very big. That even if I default, you might not be able to know where exactly that I stay in Tinder. Now you might be saying in yourself that the person might tell you the address and then he shifts the following day. Even if the person shifts, you have where to start from. You have where to start from. And for any reasonable person or sane person, you might not shift because of the small loan that you have given them. So you need to establish where in Tinder someone stays. Whether at a given apartment, specify the names. If it is an LC, specify in Tinder what? Minister's village. Uh, you know, Chizungu zone or zone A, zone B, Chiganda zone, any place that you stay at specifically. You also have to specify the details of the landlord 
where you stay. If you rent, if you own the house, you also specify that you own the house. But if you rent, you have to specify the details of the person where you rent at. The details of the LLC. So all this information that I'm telling you has to be collected in the loan application form. So you have to collect, the instance of this step is to collect as much information as you can from the client. Because in case of any eventuality, in case the client does not come through, in case the client does not pay as he or she committed to actually pay, you know where to start from. Because you have this information on this particular client. And mind you, unless for fraudulent clients, some of the clients come genuinely ask for money with even the intentions that they actually will pay. But when things turn a bit upside down, they, they start to devise means on how they can default. So at the wanting of the money, most of the time, unless the client comes intentionally to defraud you of your money, which actually happens because there are some who prepare properly. And along our chats and our discussions in our conversations, during our talks in the first step that I'll be sharing with you, I'll come to tell you key life examples of those who plan properly to come and defraud you. But those notwithstanding, most of the clients, when they come for money, they genuinely want to pay. So they actually give you right information. So you have to maximize on the loan application form. You have to double check the adequacy of the loan application form so that the information that you collect is very detailed and to the dots and to the dots and it can help you it can help you collect the information that you actually need. So you need to be very, very critical on the information that you yes. capture on the loan application form. You have to be very critical on the information that you collect on the loan application forms. So you have to check the adequacy of the loan application forms to make sure that they provide you with adequate information that in case a client fails to pay, you can actually take them on. Now, I am not preempting, I am not preempting that the client will not default. I am not preempting that all the clients that come your way will be bad clients. No. Some of them will be very good. So if I'm a good client, I won't hesitate to give you the right information. I won't hesitate to share with you my national ID. I won't hesitate to share with you the details of my ID. My workplace ID or the address of my workplace. I won't hesitate. So that's why it's important that you collect as much information as possible. Step number three, in drafting your form to assess the adequacy, the loan application form, next of kin of this person. If the person is married, they have, they have to provide the details of the person, of the spouse. This is very helpful, especially for some of the collaterals. For example, you can imagine if this person is going to commit, is going to commit their house as a collateral and they are married. They are staying in that house. Yes, he has the land title and it's in his names, but it's where their marital home is seated. So in case you're going to foreclose on that, which should be the list of the list after trying all the other means, in case you're going to foreclose on that, you need to have got the spousal consent. That's why it's even important that the spouse signs as the applicant on the loan application while applying for a loan. So the spouse has to apply. It has the provision on your loan application form that the spouse has to fill in the information as well. Either as a next of kin or as a spouse. So there has to be two provisions. So if the spouse is not the, the next of kin, then you have to, have to have the information of the next of kin. So you have to fill in those details. The next one is the workplace. 
if I have a workplace, it is thought that I have a supervisor. Even if I am the MD of, this, of, of the company, the supervisor could be, for example, in government, if I'm a CEO, it could be a PS, or it could be any other supervisor. But if it's a CEO, then you can also know that this person is a CEO. The treatment could be different based on how you run your company. But any other person has a supervisor. So you, it's, it's pertinent that you capture the details that you capture, like the phone contact, the email, or any details of that person's supervisor. Because what I'm telling you is that if this person is genuine, there is no reason as to why they should actually hide the details of their supervisor. Because they intend to pay. And in case they fail to pay, perhaps they would like to use their salaries to pay back the loan. So sharing the details of the supervisor is not a bad one. So it's important that those details come through. They have to come through, some. Now, if the person shares with you the details of the supervisor, it is not advisable, you as a company, or you as a lender, to start engaging the supervisor from the word go. For example, if I'm sending the latest emails of, of the outstanding loan, the loan amount, which could be done by the system, you do not have to capture that information of the supervisor in the system. Because, because also on the side of the client, there's key confidentiality clauses that are captured in the details that you have to protect the client on. If I share with you my supervisor details, it's not plausible, especially if I've not defaulted, that you send emails to my, to my supervisor telling them that, you know what, <laughs> your, your subordinate has a loan. It's not plausible and it's against the ethical conduct of most of the companies. So this information is shared with you, keep it as confidential, and you only use it when that time comes, when it has to be helpful, or when things have gone haywire. So it's important that all this information this person shared with you is kept in confidentiality, and that you do not divulge it unless it has come to a time when the person has also become slippery and they've totally uh, refused or failed to pay. And you're trying to engage different parties and identify ways through which you can actually recover the money. The other key thing is a guarantor. Now you have to capture the information of the guarantor on your loan application form. You also realize that there are several forms that you might have to fill because there's a the loan application form, there's a loan agreement, and there's a letter of offer. Now, I started with the loan application form, and this is the one that you use to collect as much information as possible. The other key information that you might have to collect is the bank details of the person that has applied for a loan. If it is a mobile phone, because some of the clients, they say, based on the amount of money that they apply for, if it's one million or 500,000, that makes sense to actually necessarily wire it to his account. So you could wire on their phones, registered in their names. So they could provide you with their phones that you can actually double check. You can double check the details of the phone by trying to send mobile money. Airtel or MTN, it brings out the names of the actual person. If the phone is not registered in a person's names, Please, save yourself headache, do not wire the money there. The key thing you also have to do away with is don't give out cash. There has to be a trail on how the money leaves the account to the client's account, whether by phone or by account. Two, is that if the client gives you the account details, the bank details, you need to confirm that those details are in the names of the client. If I come to apply as Jonan, I don't have to bring my bank details as David, reading David. That means you've not given a loan to, to Jonan, who has actually applied, but rather you have given the loan to David, which is a different thing altogether. Even if you're going to engage in the law, 
or in court, it will turn out different. That's why it's emphasized that you wire the money to the person's account, to the applicant's account, and confirm that actually that account is in their names. Because one of the requirements that you ask for is a bank statement. And that should be enough to even show you that, you know, this is the account holder of these bank details. So, the point is, is wire the money, either on the phone, registered in the person's names, the client who has applied for a loan, or in the bank details that are registered still, or that capture the information of the client who has applied for that particular loan. So that is uh, one of the key pointers that you have to look at and they have to be captured on the loan application form. And that's how you can assess the adequacy, the adequacy of the loan application form. The rest are a little minor, but this should be adequate enough to capture the information of the client plus the, the wife or spouse based on the collateral that they've used as well as the guarantor. So that is the loan application form. So you go to the loan agreement. So the loan agreement is the binding document. It is an agreement, like you hear it, between you and the client, between your company and the client. And it has key details that are binding between you and the client. And the key binding statements on the loan agreement because you're agreeing. You're agreeing that you've given this person a loan at a particular interest rate. And the person is agreeable to your terms and he promises to pay the amount of money that you've disbursed to them plus the interest. So it's a binding document. The key pointers, especially, not only for the business of the, the company, but also for the, for the borrower, is to agree on the amount of money. So there has to be a clause or there has to be a space for the amount of money that the client has applied for. There has to be a space or a spot for the loan interest rate. Do not leave it blank, fill it. Because it's a confirmation that, you know, we've agreed on this particular rate. This is helpful not only for the company that is lending out money, but also for the person that is borrowing the money. And then you also have to agree on the method, the interest method. Is it reducing balance? Is it interest only payment method? Is it flat rate? Is it compounding? So this has to come out clearly on the loan agreement. Which interest method are you using? Which interest method are you using? Further on the same, the loan agreement, you need to agree because not the amount that you apply for is the amount of money that is going to be approved by the company. So you need to put a clause for the amount of money that is approved by the company. If I applied for 30 million and my collateral can only qualify me to access 10 million, whereas the loan, the loan amount applied for is 30 million, the loan approved amount shall be captured as 10 million. This, this will save you a lot of headache, especially if you collect. Because this saves both the borrower as well as the lender, especially the borrower. Because as I've always shared, we have to look for a way how we can clear this money lending business. It has been on both ends, the borrower and the lender involved bad clients in one or the other. So it's pertinent that these details come out very clear. And it helps both. So you need to capture the approved amount that might be different from the amount that the client applies for. So it's key that you specify that you know I applied for 30 million and it's only 10 million that has been approved. And this is captured on the loan agreement. The other key detail that has to be captured on that form is the date. The date on which someone or the client applies for a loan. 
So you need to capture that debt properly. Because I might apply for a loan today, and perhaps I say, hold up, I will need the money after one month. So you don't capture the debt when the, the loan has been applied in the agreement. It, it captures the exact debt when the, actually the amount of money that you applied for is confirmed and dispensed. So that clarity has to come out in the agreement of when the loan is disbursed. This will save you as a client, but also as a lender or as a company. Very pertinent. So those are the key details. And then also, the other key detail on the loan agreement is that this is a step at which, or it's a document at which the client as well as the guarantor have to actually sign to confirm that they agree to the terms and conditions captured therein. If there are any penalties, if there are any surcharges, they have to be particularly specified because you might not be able to specify them in the loan application because, as I shared before, that the loan application is meant to collect as much information as possible. But for the loan agreement, it's meant to capture the, the agreements that you agree on, the terms and conditions that are binding between you as the lender and the borrower. So you need to specify any surcharges, any penalties, in case someone fails to pay in the due time, or in case they have to extend the period, or in case they go beyond the time that they committed to pay. If I commit to pay within three months and some of things turn hey way, it's not a do or die, we can renegotiate and extend, but such clauses have been captured in the agreement. So it's important to you as a lender, but also as a borrower, that all these clauses or the adequacy of the loan agreement is looked into so that both parties are served. Uh, the other key document or instrument that you look at is the letter of offer. And I'm going to close with this last one, the letter of offer. Now, the letter of offer is what confirms that actually I've offered or a company has issued or dispersed a loan and the recipient or the client has received the loan. That is the letter of offer. And it has to be signed both by the client as well as their guarantor to confirm that they've actually received the funds in question. So it's an instrument that confirms the transaction. It is the letter of offer. So it has to be signed, properly signed, by those two parties. So I've highlighted three documents that you have to look at. The application, meant to collect the information. The loan agreement specifies the, the rules, the terms and, uh, terms and conditions, as well as the letter of offer. So these three documents are very pertinent, and the adequacy is important, both to the clients as well as to the lender. And you have to look at them properly that in case of, an, of any eventuality on both ends, whether by the clients or the company, the lender, you have a leeway out. You have a leeway out. Yeah, so uh, for today's discussion, I'll stop it at this, and we shall pick it up in our discussion on Friday. And I look forward to uh, seeing you as we brainstorm to grow this industry, grow ourselves, and serve ourselves better, support our businesses better, for the betterment of our, our businesses, our country, our lives, and our families. So that, that's it for now, for today. I, I look forward to having you uh, next Friday, next week. Same time, uh, 5.30 to 6. You can also check out the few discussions that we've always had on our website at www.janakiholdings.com dot com then also you can also check out on our YouTube channel John and Kanwanaho and get to um, absorb a few things that I've shared in the different areas of business. Our key focuses or our key focuses is basically business and it's what we've all along been talking about and shall continue to talk about. So I thank you guys 
I wish you a great Friday and the rest of the weekend.